Hey everyone, it's Colt. Today we're gonna to talk about everything you need to know around JavaScript arrow functions. Arrow functions are incredibly useful. They can make your code a lot more concise. There are lots of variations in how you can write them, lots of different pieces of syntax, as well as a couple of gotchas you need to look out for. That's what we're gonna talk about here. If you haven't checked out my new software engineering bootcamp, uh, take a look. It's online, it's self-paced. There's a job guarantee. If you don't get a job in six months, you don't pay a cent. Uh, you work with a mentor. Some of our mentors are from companies like Uber, Google. Um, I just talked to a student this morning, I had a long meeting with him, uh, who is working with a mentor from LinkedIn. He meets with him every single week and gets feedback on his code, asks questions. So if you're at all interested in changing careers or learning web development, and you wanna do it online without having to quit your job, and you want the security of a job guarantee, take a look at the link in the description. You can apply, you can learn more, you can talk to someone on the phone, and now the advertisement is over. Let's get back to arrow functions. As you know, most likely if you've worked with JavaScript, JavaScript is a very function heavy language. Functions are really the one concept, if you had to pick one, the one concept that you absolutely must understand, be able to work with and write in order to be a JavaScript developer. We write a lot of functions. We pass functions all the time as callbacks. We're writing asynchronous code where we have functions. Uh, it's just a fundamental part of JavaScript. And for a long time, Every time we wanted to write a function, we use the function keyword. Here is a function called divide. Yes, uh, there's some small differences, right? We could have a anonymous function. I can have a named function. So I could have done function divide like that, but I'm still using the function keyword at the end of the day. And that can get kind of lengthy. This isn't bad, but if I have some code like this where I'm using different array methods like filter and reduce, and I'm passing in an anonymous function that exists solely for the purpose of being an argument to filter or reduce, it's kind of a lot of characters to have to type function. So this is where arrow functions come in. Arrow functions are a syntactically compact alternative to a regular function expression. So what that really means is they are shorter. They're a shorter way of writing a function. And that's really the main benefit. Most of the time, it's just that they're shorter, they're more compact, but there's also some situations where they do behave differently from a traditional function expression. And that can be an advantage. It also can be something you need to look out for. So we'll cover that towards the end of this video. Before we go into the actual syntax, notice this right here, the poor Internet Explorer logo being crossed out. If you head over to MDN, scroll down to the bottom of the arrow functions page, look at our browser support table. That's a lot of red for IE, but that's pretty standard for IE as well. So just be aware, arrow functions are newer. They're pretty well supported, but just not in IE. All right, so with that said, let's take a look at the syntax. So the name arrow function is derived from the arrow that we use when we're declaring an arrow function, equal sign greater than. So here are two examples of arrow functions. One thing that you need to know right away is that arrow functions can only be anonymous functions. We cannot name an arrow function. Yes, we can store it in a variable, just like we can store a regular anonymous function expression, but we can't name it like I showed just a moment ago, function divide. That is a named function. If we have an arrow function, it's always anonymous, it follows this pattern. So parentheses, an arrow, curly braces. Now, some of this is optional sometimes, and if I want to be able to call this function later and reuse it, I'll store it in a variable. So I'll just call this one const. Um, how about we just rewrite what we have right there, divide. So divide equals, and this part is replacing this right here. So I have my arguments between those parentheses, and then the function body between curly braces, and I'll just return x divided by y. And I can call it just like any other function, divide one divided by four, 0 0.25. The next thing you should know is that those parentheses right here around X and Y are optional if you only have a single argument. So if I had a function called square, const square equals, I could do this where I have X, my arrow, and then I can return X times X, but those parentheses are not mandatory in this one scenario. So square of three is nine. I can leave them off. For some people, this is a stylistic thing. Um, certain linters will enforce that you do have those parentheses and others will enforce that you don't, but they are not mandatory as far as the language is concerned. But if we had two arguments like we do for divide, it's not gonna be happy with me. So we do need those parentheses there. And if we have no arguments, if I wanna have a function, we'll call it annoying, 
I still need those parentheses. We just leave them empty. And we'll console.log lol omg hey. We can call annoying just like any other function. lol omg hey. So parentheses, arrow, and then curly braces. However, that's actually not always the case. What's really nice about arrow functions is that there are situations where we can leave off the curly braces, we can leave off the return, and they can become even more compact. So let me show you an example. Here I have a function called isEven. It takes some number in and it returns whether that number is even or not. We mod by two and see if the remainder is zero. That should be a true or false value, we return it. So here is one version with an arrow function, kind of like what we've already been doing, num, arrow return num mod two equals zero. Here's another version, num without the parentheses because we don't need them, arrow return num mod two equals zero. Here's a third version where I'm using parentheses instead of curly braces. So those parentheses allow me to write a single expression that will automatically be returned. So I don't need the return keyword. So why don't we rewrite square, I'll just put it down here, comment out, these others, get rid of those curly braces, replace it with parentheses, and get rid of the return and the semicolon. Whatever expression is inside of these parentheses will be automatically returned. So I don't write return, it's an implicit return. If I call square of nine, we get 81. So this is looking shorter, definitely, than what we had before. We could do the same thing for divide. So let's move that one down here. Divide x, y, and instead of returning x divided by y, I could put parentheses here and just have the expression x divided by y, and that will be returned. But it gets even shorter if we want it to. I don't need those parentheses. For something so simple, something that's short, it can fit on one line, I can just rewrite it like this. So x divided by y is the return value. Now this is really nice, but it's only worth doing if you have a short enough expression. You don't want something that goes on for like 30, 40, 50, 100 characters on a single line, even if technically you can fit a single line there. In addition, there are some rules. Um, you have to have a single expression if you want to use the implicit return. So you cannot have, uh, let's say, an if statement in here. If x is greater than 0, we'll return x times x. That's not going to work. Else, whatever, if I try running this, it's going to get very confused. Syntax error, unexpected token if. It's not expecting any sort of keywords like if in here. It just wants a single expression. So most of the time, if you have a single expression, it does fit on one line. But you will see these parentheses often if you're working with React. You'll often see arrow functions used uh, to pass into map or filter or something where we have some arrow function, and then we want to return a single expression, it just happens to be a React component. Now, if you don't know React, this probably is meaningless. Let's say it's a profile component. So that may not fit on a single line if you have a lot of stuff going on. Profile name equals blah, 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 age equals. That would be tough to put on one line, but it is a single value, a single expression. It will be automatically returned because of those parentheses but I could also have just done curly braces and explicitly returned this value too. Okay, so if you don't know React, don't worry about it. Let's check out divide, our one-liner. Let's divide seven by eight, 0 0.875. So that's an example of a one-liner. This is one of the really nice parts of using arrow functions. Uh, one thing to look out for, if you are ever writing an arrow function that returns some sort of object literal, like, uh, what's a good example here? We'll just make something up. How about const make card? And this function should return an object that has a suit. Let's say suit is hearts, and it has a value of three. So this represents a card. It just always returns this one card. Presumably, uh, there would be a reason for that. It's an object, and if I wrote this function exactly as it is right now, and I tried to call it, save my file, we get a syntax error. What's happening here is that the arrow function, well, JavaScript is confused by this syntax. When it encounters curly braces, it assumes that it's a function body. So it thinks that our function looks like this. 
It's looking for some valid line in a function body. It's not treating it as an object literal. So if you ever are trying to implicitly return something like this, you're trying to implicitly return an object literal, you need to wrap it in parentheses. And now JavaScript knows, oh, this is just a return value. It's not actually the curly braces for a function body. And now I can call make card. It's useless, but it does work. So yes, we can write arrow functions as standalone functions that we save in a variable like I've been doing. But really where I end up using them the most is when I'm passing a function in as an argument somewhere, which is a pretty common thing to do in JavaScript. Here I've got an array called invoices. Imagine I'm running a plumbing business and I'm keeping track of my clients uh, and invoices for some reason with a JavaScript array. We've got an array of objects, a client name, an amount that they owe, and then whether they have paid or not. So down here, I'm creating a variable called still owed to figure out how much money I'm still owed at this point. What are the outstanding invoices that have not been paid? And I'm filtering based off of who has not paid, not invoice dot has paid. So that will give me an array with the three, I think it is, yeah, three objects, three clients who have not paid, has paid is false. And then I'm running reduce on that to sum all of those amounts together, those three amounts, and I end up with $830.83. So this is kind of a lot of syntax to do something pretty common and pretty simple. So let's try writing an arrow function version. Still owed equals invoices, and then I'll just drop down to the next line, dot filter, and then I'll use an arrow function. So for invoice, why don't we just call it i? It's kind of cheating because that will make it shorter anyway, but sure, let's use i. And then instead of doing curly braces and return, I can just do a one-liner, not i dot has paid. That will automatically be returned. True or false, filter wants a callback that returns true or false, so that should work for us. Let's take a look at still owed. It is that array that's been filtered, a new array with the three clients who still have to pay. Then I can add my dot reduce, do it on one line as well. And if you're not familiar with reduce, I can't remember if I have a YouTube video on this or not. Uh, if not, I'll put one out shortly. It can be kind of confusing, but this isn't a video on reduce. So we'll just run through it really quickly. Um, there are two arguments to this callback, a total often called accumulator, just call it total. And then invoice will be each element in the array that we're reducing. Just call it I again. And then I'm just going to return total plus invoice dot amount. So total plus I dot amount. And then I pass in the initial value for reduce as zero. So if you're not sure about reduce, this is more about arrow functions. Anyway, take a look at the difference here. Significant difference. Let's try running this. Just save my code look at still owed, and we get the exact same value. So this is much, much shorter, much nicer to write over this, especially when we're doing these one-off functions that we don't ever, we can't even reuse. So at this point, really, we've just been talking about arrow functions as a shorter, or as MDN puts it, more syntactically compact alternative, which they clearly stole from my slide, syntactically compact alternative. But that's actually not the only difference between arrow functions and regular functions. If we go back to MDN and we scroll down to this part right here that says no separate this, this is the second important distinction between regular function expressions and arrow functions, aside from them being shorter. Arrow functions do not get their own value of this like a regular function expression does. So if you need to brush up on this, here's a quick crash course. The keyword this is going to change. It's going to be set in a given function depending on how the function is called. But with an arrow function, the keyword this is not going to change relative to the, the context or the parent that the function is defined in. So for example, if I had an object, const person, and this person has a name, the name is Bilbo, and then I have a method, and this method could be called uh, say hi. And I'll do a regular function expression, and it's just going to console.log this.name. So when I execute this function, I'll call it like person. Well, I guess I shouldn't just say this.name. I'll go with this.name says hi. Okay. When I call person.say hi, the value of this is going to be determined by how I'm calling it. I'm calling say hi on person. The object person will be the value of this. This.name should be Bilbo. 
so when I run the code, I get Bilbo says hi. However, if I used an arrow function instead, just comment that out, and I'll rewrite it as an arrow function like this, and I try calling it again, we just get says hi. So what's going on here is that the value of this is not being changed, is not being set when I'm calling person.say hi like a normal function would. If we look at this, console.log this, this is just set to the window object, just as if this function were defined on its own not inside of this object. And it doesn't matter how I call that function. If it's an arrow function, the value of this is not going to be set to this object unless I were to bind it or do something fancy. But on its own, an arrow function does not get a new or a different value for this. Here's another example where arrow functions could be problematic. I have uh, two different elements that I'm selecting on my HTML page. I'm not showing it to you at the moment, but there's a button and there's an H1. I'm selecting them both with query selector, and I'm adding an event listener to both of them. One is an h1, one is a button. When you click on either, we're calling make purple. Make purple is just a regular old function, a non-arrow function I've defined, that sets this.style.backgroundcolor to be purple. This will be referring to whether it was the button that was clicked or the h1 that was clicked. This will be set to that element. So if I open up the HTML and I take a look, I'll click on the h1, it turns purple. I click on the button, it also turns purple. If I were to rewrite make purple as an arrow function, save it to a variable, equals arrow function here, and I'll print out this so you can see what's going on. Console.log this. Same logic, same color equals purple. So if I try clicking now, click here, click here, we end up with two console.logs of the window object, the global value of this. We are not getting a new value for this inside of the arrow function like we would for a regular function. So that can be a problem. We do not want that behavior most of the time, but there are situations where the lack of a new value for this can be useful. Here's an example. I'll modify make purple. For some reason, I want it to have a one second delay before actually changing to purple. So I wanna click and then wait a second and then the background should turn purple. And to do that, I can use set timeout, and I pass in a callback function in here. Then I'll pass in a time, like 1,000 milliseconds, one second. Then I'll call this code in that callback. So we start that timeout, and after one second, then we change color to be purple. With a regular function, a non-arrow function, this is actually problematic. If we click, we wait a second and we get an error. Cannot set property background color of undefined. What happened here is that the value of this changed because I'm inside of a yet another function and the way that that function was called was on the window. Set timeout is a window method. So if I console.log this, I click after a second, you'll see that this is the window, but this right here is not the window. So let's print out this first and then inside the set timeout, this starts as the button and it changes to the window. Really annoying. It doesn't even look like this is on the window, but it is. This is a window method, set timeout. So that's problematic. And what we used to do before arrow functions, what was pretty common was something like this, const that equals this. So we would store the value of this up here before this callback function, and then we would set that.style.backgroundcolor. Now I'll click, wait a second, and it does turn purple. But with arrow functions, we can get around this entirely. We don't need that. Instead, we can use an arrow function right here as the callback, and we will not get a different value of this. The value of this will be the value that this was up here. We're not getting a new value because it's an arrow function, so I don't need to do that weird that equals this. I click, we wait a second, and it still works. So we just saw that arrow functions behave differently with respect to the keyword this. That can be a drawback at times. You don't want to use arrow functions for methods on an object, but if you're cognizant of that, it can be useful, like in this situation where I don't have to bind or I don't have to save the old previous value of this. I use an arrow function and I avoid that entirely. And that's kind of it for arrow functions. I don't know why I said kind of it. We've covered a lot. Uh, the syntax, shorter, more adorable, especially when you can get a nice one-liner with an implicit return. You don't need curly braces. You don't have to write function. You don't write return. 
But remember, arrow functions are always anonymous. You cannot name them. They're great, especially as callbacks. They don't get their own value of this. And I think that's it. As I do this little video end cap, here's some footage of one of my cats. So thank you for watching everyone. If you're not subscribed already, I just highly recommend it. I can't recommend it enough. You'll never regret it. So please consider subscribing, uh, leave any comments, especially if you have feedback or ideas for future videos and like the video, all that stuff. Uh, I really appreciate it. Have a great day and uh, I'll be back next week.